Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome to CAF Warbird Tube. This is episode number 153 of Warbird Tube. Joining us tonight is the founder of the Southern Heritage Air Museum and the foundation there, uh, Dan Fordyce. We'll talk to Dan in just a moment. Uh, but before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe. And if you are uh, watching on YouTube, make sure you click that bell icon and we'll send you notifications when our new uh, episodes are posted to YouTube. All right, now Warbird Tube is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. To find out more about the CAF, our events, our aircraft, uh, all the good things that are happening around the country, actually around the world with the Commemorative Air Force, just go to our website, commemorativeairforce.org, and there you'll also have an opportunity to sign up and become a member and uh, join all the fun that uh, you can have with the CAF. Now, as you're watching tonight, you may have some questions for our guest, Dan. If you do, just type those in the chat box, and we'll save some time either uh, during the presentation to answer those questions or before we sign off tonight. And joining me now uh, from the uh, the hangar, a uh, beautiful hangar down there in uh, with the uh, Southern Heritage Air Museum, Dan Fordyce. Dan, good to have you here on the show. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. Well, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, – kind of your uh, expertise and, and experience in aviation? Well, my uh, my father got his first airplane when I was five years old, so I grew up sitting in his lap making airplane noises and thinking I was flying since about five years old. Got my license when I was about 20. I was a, a late bloomer, I guess. I didn't get it on my 16th birthday like some folks. Got my license when I was about 20 years old. Um, and... Um, joined my family's uh, third generation. I was third generation construction company, and we've always had an airplane in the construction company. So uh, I took care of uh, our Louisiana operation, which was about a oh, three hour drive. Some of it, some jobs, four, four hours or more drive or, you know, about a one hour flight. So uh, I spent a lot of time flying to, to job sites and all with the construction company. Well, and you also uh, spent some time in the service as well. Well, I did. I uh, I was in the Army for 13 years, and uh, most of that was in the National Guard. I was on active duty for about four years. And what did you fly there? But I didn't get to fly there. Uh, my mother apologized uh, all of my life for giving me bad eyes. <laughs> so I've never been able to qualify for uh, for the military and aviation anyway, so I had to, had to buy all my own avgas. <laughs> and you've got uh, quite an extensive resume of uh, uh, aircraft that you've flown, and uh, in fact, some that are actually behind you at the moment. Yes, um, uh, the one right behind me is, of course, my favorite one, the uh, P-51, and uh, it was flown by Kerry Salter, who is seen here, and uh, that's his bride, Charlotte. And uh, we got this airplane back in 2009. And um, I flew it once or twice and then immediately took it to the paint shop because I didn't want anybody to remember what it looked like when I bought it. I wanted it to be remembered as Charlotte's Chariot 2, which was uh, Carrie's airplane in the war. And Carrie is kind of the, the sort of the inspiration for the, uh, the museum and the foundation. Yeah, um, I guess I got to go back to the very beginning. Um, I joined... The Quiet Birdman, which is kind of a flying fraternity. Yeah. It's got its roots back to uh, World War I pilots. And, of course, they had all passed away by the time I came along. And uh, But World War II pilots had kind of taken over the reins. And when I got in the Jackson hangar, we had, um, oh, probably 15 World War II pilots that were still in there. And we had a dinner once a month. And I never missed a dinner back in those days because uh, they would all come and I would just get with a different one of them every month and 
talk to them about their experiences and listen to their stories. And it was just incredible uh, what they had been through. And, you know, we look at the famous people, Bud Anderson, uh, Chuck Yeager. Uh, they generally did something one day that made them famous. And the other 364 days in the year, uh, guys like Kerry and the guys that I was in the Jackson hangar with did the exact same thing right beside them. Uh, they just weren't as well known. But uh, after listening to all those stories, I said, we got to do something to honor these guys. At the time when I first started meeting them, they were about 75 years old. And so I figured that the best way to do this was to get a camera out and um, and take down their stories and video their stories. And I thought I was just going out to um, hang out with some old guys and hear some really cool flying stories. And it became the most emotional journey of my life. It was uh, it was really incredible uh, getting involved with these guys. And I still don't fully understand it, but they would talk to me endlessly and still not go talk to their families. Um, one of the guys local here in Vicksburg that I interviewed, I went to high school with his daughter and about two weeks after the interview, she called me and she said, send me a copy of that tape. He still won't tell me what he did in the war. Um, but for whatever reason, um, they wouldn't hold back at all. And they would talk to me. I had one of the interviews I did. I had a uh, son in the room with us and uh, he was probably 55 years old at the time. And when I got through, I looked over at him and he was crying, just tears pouring down his face. And um he said, Dad, you've never told me any of this. And then his dad started crying. And he said, I didn't think anybody cared. And then I started crying. And I cranked the camera back up. And we went for another hour. Um, I don't know and I don't know why. I don't care why uh, they would talk to me. But it was very valuable. And, and uh, we built a connection uh, doing all of that with the old guys up. Uh, a couple of them have writ written books, and um, they, they write things on the page when they give me their book that said, you know, most people won't understand this, but I wish you had been there with us. Uh, so it was, you know, getting to know those guys was just the greatest experience of my life. Yeah. And um, I'm now involved a lot uh, with um, post-9-11 Purple Heart veterans, and between the two of them, the thing that they have really given me is they have taken away my ability to have a bad day. And I'm very, very grateful to both groups of veterans. That's amazing. Well, let's, let's dive into the museum a little bit and kind of, uh, we, we want folks to come down and visit you, but we're going to give them a little taste of, of uh, what they'll see when they, they come down there. Yeah. Um, so when these guys started to, um, get old and pass away, basically. Before they did, they would bring me their, they call it their stuff. Yeah. And, um, or right after they died, their, their family would bring it to me. And we ended up with a warehouse full of stuff. And I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. This is not where this is supposed to be. And so we bought a hangar here at the airport at uh, Tallulah, Vicksburg. We're just across the river from Vicksburg. We're actually in Louisiana. And we started displaying all of their stuff. Um, we've probably got 20 uh, World War II veteran stuff in here. Um, it may be a little bit more than 20. Uh, and none of them are with us anymore. Uh, they all used to come over here whenever we had an event. There were times when we had upwards of 10 veterans in here when we would have an event and today there are none um but we've got some very historical uh, items in here what you're looking at right now um uh is material that was uh the guys found a crashed japanese zero and they cut pieces of metal off of it and they made rings and bracelets and jewelry for their wives and um, that's what this is right here. It's all made out of the uh, skin of a, a Japanese zero. And so um, we have a lot of events here um, uh, educating the public. Uh, I have heard entirely 
too many high school kids refer to it as WW11. And uh, if we can just stop one of those, uh, I will feel like we've been successful. Yeah. Um, but so we, we started, uh, we bought the hangar and we started displaying all of these items. Uh, Patty Mekas runs the uh, museum and just does a tremendous job. We just reopened. We closed down pretty much every year about the end of the year and, and opened about the middle of March. Two reasons. It's just too cold to try to keep this hangar, hangar warm enough to get people in here. And uh, it's time to redo the whole thing so that every time you come in here, it's not it, it, everything's changed up. This was a really big uh, change renovation right now. Uh, we've got, if you look at the American, big American flag behind me, it also hides a room that we've got that's air conditioned and all that hide, that, that keeps all of the um, uh, memorabilia and things that are not on display uh, up there. And so we've got plenty of stuff to be able to swap out. And we've got people today that just uh, come by all the time and uh, bring things over here. We've got one guy that's uh, in the furniture business. He, he hauls between North Carolina and Las Vegas, and he stops on in his 18-wheeler and goes to garage sales. If there's anything World War II, he stops and buys it and brings it by here and just stops in all the time. And then we still have people that come in um, to bring their, uh, their father or their uncle or their grandfather's memorabilia. Um, we saw a lot of this on, um, Masters of the Air. I'm hoping yeah. that everybody watching this has been watching that series. Uh, it was brutal, brutal conditions in the B-17s at 25, 30,000 feet, sometimes 60 degrees below zero. And they had the windows open. Yeah. Uh, so it was just brutal conditions and they were up there for eight hours sometimes. So, uh, this is a full, um, suit that the uh, gunners and all had to wear in the uh, in the bombers of the day. Yeah. Talking about the museum and, and you mentioned being closed for the quote unquote winter months, but I, I think it's important to, to note that uh, this is this is all volunteer run uh, as far as the museum goes. I mean, you've got a, a whole cadre of volunteers that, that help make this uh, make this possible. Yeah, we've got some of the greatest volunteers in the world here. Um, and it, it, it's been a lot of fun to watch, um, all the people that have, uh, really gotten into the whole project and now they know about World War II. It's funny, uh, when Patty, uh, came on here at first, she didn't know the pointy end from the square end of an airplane. And so the first thing I did is sat down and pulled out a World War II airplane book and turned the page and I said, what's that? She said, I don't know. I turned the page. So what's that? She said, I don't know. I said, you're now running a World War II air museum. You got to know these things. Yeah. And now you can flip through the book and she knows all of them. This is an interesting display right here. Um, a school nurse that we all knew in town came through and was taking a tour. And she said, I've got a, um, a footlocker of all of my dad's stuff from the war. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. You can see his medals. He's got a purple heart there. And um, she said, I've moved it four times. I'm not going to move it anymore. Uh, do y'all want it or I'm going to throw it away? And sure, we, we, we want that. So Patty set this display up. And next time I was in the museum, I came by and she was showing it all to me. And you can't really see it from here, but right up to the right of his head um, is his meal ticket on board the USS Enterprise. And when she was showing that to me, I said, Patty, that doesn't make any sense because the Battle of the Bulge was over in May the 8th and, and uh, we weren't through the, with the uh, Enterprise in the Pacific until the middle of September. And um, so I went outside and I called the World War II Museum, the historians down there in New Orleans, and I said, listen to what I have. And they said, well, that doesn't make any sense. I said, I know that. I know. <laughs> That's why I'm calling the National World War II Museum. They called me back the next day and they said um, that was known as Operation Magic Carpet. Operation Magic Carpet is what we did to get everybody back home after the war. 
we had over 16 million people in uniform during the war. I don't know how many we had deployed when the war was over in 1945, but Operation Magic Carpet was underway for 16 months. That means we did not get everybody back in the United States until 1947. How would you like to be on a deserted island somewhere in the South Pacific uh, for 16 months after the war was over with? Um, but I couldn't pass up the, the moment. I said, all right, guys, if y'all ever, ever need to know anything about World War II, y'all just give us a call up here to Southern Heritage Air Foundation, and we'll, we'll take care of it. And I got to tell you, three or four times I have been in the museum in New Orleans, and I've heard a docent mention Operation Magic Carpet. I said, okay, there you go. This is Nat and Fred Hovius. They were identical twins. Um, when I got off of active duty out of the Army, I, I was stationed in Germany, and I came home, and I was single, and um, I met Nat Hovius, and he had just lost his wife. Uh, he lived right around the corner from me growing up, but I never knew he was in World War II or anything, and so I just started visiting with him, and I'd go over and spend hours with him, and he was he was very lonely, and sometimes he'd pull all his medals out. We'd talk about the war. Sometimes we'd just talk about the weather or sports or whatever. But some of the stories he told me were great. Um, his brother Fred was killed in the South Pacific, but uh, they got in at the same time. And um, when they went to take their initial physical, one of them had a heart murmur and the other one had astigmatism. And so they both failed their initial flight physicals and they recalled them and they swapped uniforms and they were so nervous they were going to get caught. They even swapped underwear and they went in and took each other's test and passed with flying colors. So they ended up flying B-25s in the South Pacific and um uh, this is the first thing that I always like to um, talk about on our tour because uh, Nat's daughter called me one day and she said, we're taking dad to a nursing home. And would you like to come over here and pick up all of this stuff or should I throw it away? And I say that not to disparage her, but this is going on a thousand times a day in America. It's not right now, but it was at the time. Mm -hmm. And what are they going to do with all this stuff? You know, like the school nurse moved it four times and then she was ready to throw it away. So not at all trying to disparage her. It's just that, you know, you're going to keep it in a box and you're never going to pull it back out again. So we like to we liken ourselves to an alternative to waste management. You can throw this stuff away or you can bring it over here and we'll display it for generations to come to try to educate people on what these, uh, what these people went through. Um, and I've got boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff. I've actually got, um, there was a B-25 flying along beside Fred's airplane when he got shot down and, and they, they flew it you know, a hundred feet in the B-25s uh, where they were. He said that, you know, you, it was not unusual to come back with chickens in your cowling and, and everything else. And I've got a 17 frame shot of Fred being shot down and, and splashing into a rice field and, and blowing up. And we don't display that. It's in the box, still in the cabinet. I don't know exactly how to do that, but that's some of the stuff that was going to get thrown away and there's stuff getting thrown away every year. It's either they throw it away or they think they've got a gold mine and they put it on eBay. Yeah. Um, one or the other, but you know, you, you can't blame, um, the families. Um, th these guys never talked about what they did. They may not have ever even pulled all this stuff out. You know, they just at some point saw that they got a whole bunch of papers and medals that they don't know anything about in a box somewhere. Um, so, um, you know, this is it, it, it's very important history um, that needs to be told. And I shudder to think how much of it has been lost over the years uh, before we really started paying attention to it, because I remember I remember when the right stuff came out about Chuck Yeager. Nobody in this country knew who Chuck Yeager was 
when the right stuff came out until the movie had come out. And it was kind of about that time frame that we really started paying attention to these guys and to the history and everything else. And unfortunately, now you had to be 97 or 98 to have served in World War II right now. Yeah. And so uh, there's very few of them left. And uh, so it's just vitally important that we keep this history. Oh, so so very much, very much so. And as you had mentioned earlier, when you were talking about interviewing the veterans and how many times they don't even tell their families the stories. So, you know, it, it, it only stands to reason that when your dad or granddad passes away and there's just this box of stuff, they don't, they don't understand because they've never been told what that, that story was and where that, where that came from. So to be able to fill in the blanks, uh, you know, with some of those interviews that you've done um, with families. And it's, it's amazing. And it's a recurring theme that I've, I've heard with, with others who have gathered oral histories is that they will talk to someone that they kind of know, you know, like you, but it's not a family member and they'll tell their entire story, but it's not something they ever wanted to share with their family for whatever reason. But at least there are people like you, Dan, out there who are gathering those stories because as you said, there's, there's, there's too many people who call it, you know, WW11 and it's, it's, it's up to people like, like us to, to keep those stories alive there. It's such an important part of, of who we are as a country and as, as a world. They were briefed by the military when they got out, not to yeah. ever tell anybody yeah. anything about what they had experienced because it would just freak them out. And, they, they stuck yeah. to that pretty well. And we now know, uh, finally, um, you know, PTSD was known as weakness mm-hmm. back then. And so nobody wanted to admit to any of that. And we now know that the best thing in the world to do is to talk about what you've been through and especially uh, talking about that with other people that were there and and. and We've got another not-for-profit that we'll talk about here in a little bit, and and that's what we're doing now with modern-day veterans, and uh, and it is so important. Um, but when I was interviewing them, it became clear to me pretty quick that every one of them saw a different war. The pilot was looking at the other airplane in formation trying to keep up with him. The co-pilot was looking at the instruments trying to keep the airplane healthy enough to keep running. The tail gunners back in the back looking at where they've been, the ball turret gunners looking down, the infantryman's looking up going, man, I'm glad I'm not in that crate right now. But I maintain that they all saw something that nobody else saw. And I always dug for that nugget. There was always something in there. And I'm, I had interviews that went on for hours and I was just nodding off. And then all of a sudden, bam. And it was just something that you couldn't read about in history books. A couple of examples. Um, Leonard Katzmeyer was talking about flying the P-47 and talking about how uh, this thing was just a flying tank. You just couldn't destroy the P-47. And, and it got so shot up. And, and um, I said, what's the most damaged airplane you ever had to bring back? And he said, uh, curled props. You always seen how when they land belly belly landing without the gear and the props curl back and then he just kept talking i said whoa 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 stop a minute i said curl props i said how do you curl your props while you're out flying and then come home he said the first time i hit the ground and then he kept talking again i well stop stop the first time how many times did you do this he said uh the first time i hit the ground the second time i'm not sure if it was the buildings or the trees that i ran into that's why we send 30 or 20 year olds into combat. Uh, the rest of us have more sense than to fly like that. That's right. <laughs> uh, another one of my favorites is um, back in the early to mid 40s, um, ice was a very difficult commodity to come by in England. And uh, they gave some whiskey or brandy. Uh, after every mission to the uh, pilots and the Yanks want ice in their whiskey. And so uh, one of them told me how they finally figured out how to get ice. They would dispatch 100 B-17s to go bomb Germany 
and every day they'd dispatch one extra one with ice trays on board. He'd fly up to 30,000 feet and circle around until it all froze, and then he had a big ice chest, and there he'd empty out the ice trays into the ice chest, and they'd come back down, and when all the pilots came back, they had a full ice chest full of ice every day, fresh ice so that they could make their drinks. The most expensive ice in the yes. world, but they never had a shortage of ice. They always had Avgas. There you go. Well, and one of the things with uh, that, that happens at the museum is, is you do a lot of uh, outreach as well. And this is a, a very a couple of frames here from a very special uh, presentation. Yeah, we do. Um, uh, we bring a lot of uh, authors in and a lot of programs into the museum. And this was this was extremely special. Um, when Patty told me her plan of putting all these uh, elementary school kids on the floor um, to listen to a presentation, I said, this is about the dumbest idea I've ever heard. There, this could go south in so many different directions. Um, but it was absolutely amazing. Uh, you could have heard a pin drop. We did this three times. We had over a thousand kids come through here. And what this is, um, uh, Jana was Ukrainian and the Germans came in and took her whole village out and machine gunned the whole village. Um, and her dad gave his gold watch to one of the German guards and shuffled her off in the woods so she could get away. And she was a piano prodigy at the time. Um, and she had one piece of sheet music that she grabbed with it when she left the house. It was a uh, Beethoven piece. And um, she went back to the town she was from and nobody would take her in because if they got caught with her, the Germans would have killed them as well. And finally, one family said, we can't leave. She was 10 years old at the time. We can't leave a 10-year-old that just had her whole family killed out on the streets in January in the Ukraine. And so they took them in, and they ended up, uh, her sister showed up, and her sister never talked about it. She never knew her. It was your younger sister. She was six or eight, and her sister never told her how she came back. But... Um, the family that took her in uh, gave her a new name, gave her a new identity, said her parents had been killed, and they ended up putting her in an orphanage. And she was playing an out-of-tune piano one day, and a German um, officer was walking down the street and heard it and had a, an appreciation for how good that was and went in and got her and brought her out, and she entertained the German high command for the entire war. And her dad told her when she uh, when when he got her away, uh, he said, "Just live. You must live because somebody has to tell this story." And so every time she was on stage, and I remember, you know, she's ten, eleven, twelve years old during the war. She would address the piano and she would look out into the crowd and she said, "You are all the people." You are the people that killed everybody I know. And um, this is um, Greg Dawson is her her daughter, her son, excuse me. And he ended up writing a book because one day his his daughter had a um, a, a project to um, talk to somebody about the Holocaust. And she was in junior high school, and she said, well, I know somebody that's about that age. So she talked to her grandmother, and she said, you know, I've got this project going on at school. And Jonna said, sit down. I've got a story to tell you. She had never told anybody. And she told her this story, and she went in to her dad and said, Dad, why did you never tell me this? He said, what is she talking about? And he went in there, and he said, Mama, what, what are you telling my daughter? And he, she said, sit down. I got a story to tell. And so he wrote the book called Hiding in the Spotlight. And so we got the grand piano in the hangar. And he warned me. He said, sometimes she'll play, sometimes she won't. She played for all the high school kids. Again, we had that full crowd in here three times. It was a little over a 1,000 young kids. 
And one of the eight-year-olds, we had the local TV station here, and one of the eight-year-olds was interviewed by the TV station. And uh, the eight-year-old said, I just got to meet a Holocaust survivor. My kids will never get to do that. An eight-year-old that got it. And so that night we had, I don't know, two, three hundred people in here. We had a big dinner, and so we had adults in here at night. And it was pretty cold. And she went into the um, restroom area. And um, I was kind of doing a song and dance, waiting on her to come out because it was time for her to play. And finally, I went back in there. And uh, they said, it's too cold. She says she can't play. And I said, well, tell her to come in. She came out. I said, what's wrong? She said, it's just too cold. I can't play. And I said, well, put your hands over under here, under my arms. And I held her and hugged her and talked to her. And I said, now, let's go play. She said, okay, we'll do it. So she went out and played for us. And uh, and that was uh, very special. But we've got to remember, we now have people saying that the Holocaust never happened. And so, you know, it is so important that we keep all of these memories going. Next slide, we have just yeah, a, is... a bunch of people that were in here. And again, we've got over 20 that used to come in here that we've got memorabilia from them. And um, um, today they're all gone. I see one in there, uh, Guy Brown. I need to tell his story. Um, my good friend, John Mosley, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, built up a uh, TBM Avenger and he called me and he said, I want to paint it up like somebody from Mississippi that flew one, but I can't find anybody. And so uh, we found a guy and he was actually from Vicksburg named Guy Brown. And so I got to asking around Vicksburg, nobody knew Guy Brown. So I put my wife on it. She's kind of a, uh, a genealogist and uh, she came up with a whole litany of stuff. He was a tennis star. He was a uh, honor roll student. And so we were looking. Uh, he was killed on July 28, 1945, uh, when his airplane was shot down. And on the um, accident report, uh, it had his address was 3300 Drummond Street. Well, that's right down the street from where I grew up. So one Sunday, we were coming home from church. We were counting the street numbers down, and, well, there it is. That's his house. It was right next door to my best friend's house. And the current occupants of the house were out in the front yard. So we stopped the truck, got out, and went over there, and we were telling them the story about John building the airplane and all this. And the more I talked, the more serious their demeanor got. And finally, the gentleman said, finally, you have arrived. He said, follow me. And he took me down into the basement. And in the washroom in the basement, uh, Guy Brown's mother had kept in pencil on the wall all of his comings and goings during the war. And the last entry was July 28, 1945, missing in action. It didn't have any names or anything on it, so they knew that it was something historically significant, but they had no idea what it was. Wow. And so I told him, I said, I got to have that. It was it was on tongue and groove lumber uh, on the wall there. And I said, I got to have that. He said, I knew you were going to say that. He said, if it was sheetrock or something, I'd give it to you. But that's a integral part of my house. I said, I'm in the construction business. I can rebuild your house. I got to have that. And so on Memorial Day, we went in and sawzawed uh, part of the wall out. His wife was not very happy about all that, but. Uh, so we've got that here in the museum, and we, we put it back in, in tongue and groove lumber just like it came out and put a plaque on there stating why it was uh, new lumber and where the, where the original had gone. So it's probably the most significant uh, historical thing that we have in here. And, you know, today over 200 people know who guy brown is because john mosley decided to build that airplane uh but no i can't find anybody in vicksburg that had ever heard of him incredible, incredible. so you know following those leads down on the internet and all have, have has been uh very rewarding and with the the stories that you're telling um you're telling 
lots of veteran stories, but you're also sort of, um, as you mentioned a couple of times, kind of zeroing in on those who are in the local area from from where you are to, to preserve their their stories, uh, just like Guy Brown's story that that no one knew until you discovered it and shared it. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sitting here looking at the pictures. Uh, one of them is Mark Posey's mother. She was a Marine in Marine Sergeant in World War II. And if you can remember, younger people don't remember this, but older people remember uh, one of the jabs we used to give at each other in elementary school was your mama wears combat boots. Yep. He said, my mama really did wear combat boots. How would you like to have a Marine sergeant for your mother? <laughs> and then uh, looking at Bill Curtis in here, Bill Curtis was in the Coast Guard and he was at D-Day. And I said, what was the Coast Guard doing at D-Day? He said, that's what I was wondering. He said, I was 19 years old, and this is the first time I'd been more than 50 miles from my house. And we showed up on June the 4th in England, and we went into a bar, and some big, crusty old Army E-7 said, uh, hey, the Coast Guard's here. The invasion's on. And uh, they kind of saddled up to him and said, what are you talking about? He said, we never invade until y'all show up, and you're always the last one to get here. That was June 4th, 1944, and D-Day happened two days later. Yeah. Um, and uh, right after D-Day, it took him a couple of days before he went on shore, but he said three or four days after D-Day, he said there's still, the beaches were just red, uh, bodies were still floating, and he was in a 110-foot supply boat, and they pulled up to a dock, and an Army general came by, and, and there were two 19-year-olds in this 110-foot, big, wide-open supply boat. And the general came over, and he said, gentlemen, I need you all to do me a favor. And he said, what's that? He said, I want you all to run up this river for about a mile just as fast as you can. Find your wide spot up there somewhere, turn it around, and come back fast as you can run it. And they're just kind of like, really? <laughs> yeah, thank you, sir. Okay. So they get in it and just firewall it, and he's talking about this. You can see the water sucking out of the river in front of them and blowing up on the banks behind them, and they're high-fiving and having a big old time. And they get up about a mile, find a wide spot, turn around, and come screaming back down. And they get back down and tie it up to the dock and jump out, and he's still standing there. And they say, okay, General, anything else you need? He said, nope. Now we know the river's not mine. <laughs> So I'm looking at Howard Richardson. Howard Richardson was a dear friend. He was a QB with me over in Jackson. Howard stayed in. He flew 45 missions in a B-17 named Mississippi Miss. And he stayed in for 30 years, became a full colonel, flew everything up to B-52s. But what he's most famous for is he lost the third atomic bomb during the Cold War. Um, uh, you may have heard of the Savannah bomb or the Tybee Island bomb. It was dropped off the coast of Savannah. Uh, he had had a midair collision. He didn't even know what had happened. He didn't. He ran into an F-86 and didn't know it. Um, but he knew that the engine was hanging off the end of the wing and the airplane was flying very poorly. And so uh, he radioed down and told Savannah he was, you know, had something had happened. He's coming in to land and requested permission to release the weapon. And two o'clock in the morning, who's on duty, a sergeant or something? Well, he's got to get permission from the top, the head of SAC headquarters. And so they're trying to do all that, and they're circling, and the airplane's flying really bad, and this bomb weighs 7,000 pounds. And finally, he figured, I'm not going to get everybody back safely, and he told the bombardier, he said, release the weapon and mark the spot. And the bombardier said, do what? <laughs> he said, right now, release the weapon and mark the spot. So he went to his grave declaring that the capsule was not inserted. The, 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 uh, this is a 7,000 pound block of TNT with a capsule about the size of a, a bowling ball that's put in there and it's an implosion device. Implodes in there, that creates the nuclear device. So it was a Mark 15 nuclear weapon, but it wasn't, arm, it wasn't loaded with uranium or plutonium is what it was. And so it wasn't going to have a nuclear explosion. He went to his grave claiming that. To this day, the Air Force claims that the capsule was inserted. So, you know, a lot of questions. Did they lie to the um, aircraft commander or what? But anyway, uh, he gave me his, the hand receipt. 
whenever anything is changes hands in the military, you got to hand receipt it. And so uh, he hand receipted the bomb and it's got a line on there and it says tear across this line and give it back to the pilot once he turns the bomb back in. Well, he never did. So we are now, I maintain, we're the only museum in the world that has holds the hand receipt to a nuclear weapon. And they still have not found it. If they ever do find the weapon, I'm going to go turn in the hand receipt and claim it and see see what that gets me. But the History Channel did a story on this a couple of years ago, and the pilot flying the F-86 that he had the midair with was actually from Mississippi as well. And they had never met each other, and they brought them out on the beach and had them walk in together and meet each other out on the beach. But it just goes to show you that uh, if you put a couple of rednecks into some uh, uh, sophisticated equipment, something bad is going to happen somewhere. So who else do we have in there? You got uh, Jim Westbrook was on Iwo Jima. He was a Marine. Um, um, said that they landed on Iwo Jima with about 230-something people in his company. They had to get 90 replacements during the battle, and 26 of them walked off the island. He said it was just terrible. They were in constant combat for 30-something days. And he said the clothes you landed with were the clothes you left with. And he said all of us were just about completely naked when we when we walked off. Their clothes were just rotten off of you. Well, as we're, we're concentrating on World War II, uh, but also, as, as you had alluded to uh, in the introduction, you're also involved with uh, more recent uh, veterans as well. Let's talk a little yeah, bit about that. Um, my brother and I both served in the military, and we just love veterans. We've got a good hunting spot. Uh, just outside of Vicksburg, and um, so uh, we've got a, a house up in Colorado. We figured there's got to be some guys that just want to get out of the hospital, get out of the house, and go um, and go hunting and go fishing. And so uh, we started back in 2013. We started an organization called the Warrior Bonfire Program. Well, why we did that is the, our inspiration for it, Greg Williams told me I was taking him back home after an air show to Fort Polk, Louisiana, and he said, I could spend eight hours with a Ph.D. certified counselor, but what I really need is an hour around a bonfire with five or six of my buddies that were there. And I said, well, we will provide the bonfire. So Monday, we set up a not-for-profit. We called it the Warrior Bonfire Program. And all my brother and I really wanted to do was take some young soldiers out and take them hunting, take them snow skiing or whatever. And the first five minutes into the deer hunt, we were sitting around a round table at the kitchen at the hunting camp. And I got six guys in there that didn't know each other five minutes ago. And now they're acting like they're back in the unit again. They're best friends. But more importantly, they're working on each other. They're helping each other. Uh, they're trying to figure out what happened to you. What's wrong? I heard a, a, a conversation across the table. One guy said, man, I'm having this problem at the VA and I can't get it solved. Another one said, no, that's not what you do. You need to go see this person at the VA. Well, I didn't know they could do that. Yeah. They swap phone numbers and, you know, they're out there helping themselves. So a month later, I took six guys up to Colorado. We Our place is right outside uh, Winter Park. that has got the National Sports Center for the Disabled, the largest disability ski school. So we take guys up there generally, I say guys, guys and, and girls, and we take guys up there um, uh, generally uh, missing limbs and all and, and go, to the, uh, go to the school up there. And five minutes into it, the exact same thing happened again. And I went, uh-oh, there is way more to this than deer hunting and snow skiing. And so for the first year, my brother and I just uh, did it. We did probably six or eight events, and it happened at every single one of them. And I kept asking myself every day, um, today, registered with the IRS, there are over 44,000 veteran not-for-profits registered with the IRS. And every day I just said, why do we need 44,000 in one? But every time we took these guys out, they said, this is the most therapeutic thing I have ever done. This must continue. I was blown away. That was not my plan. 
That is not what I wanted to do. I just wanted to go out and have a good time with them and go deer hunting. I didn't want to give them the most therapeutic thing they had ever done. But we ended up with a recipe that is really, really working well. Uh, not what we set out to do, and certainly not because we're smarter than anybody else. It's not even what we wanted to do. Um, but we put them in a safe place, and we let them work with each other. Um, they say that um, so many times the counselor says, I know how you feel. And they say, I'll just stand up and walk out because, you know, there's no need in us continuing talking anymore because you do not know how I feel. And that's the first thing I'm going to tell them. I was in the Army for a long time, so I understand the nomenclature, and I know a little bit about soldiers and all that, but I got no idea how they feel. Um, the Still the best friends that I have are the guys that I serve with. Uh, and the uh, camaraderie that's built in combat has got to be 10x of that. Uh, I don't know how they feel, um, but we made a video early on, and in that video, my brother said, these men and women, the amazing thing is these men and women did this just because our country asked them to, and I got to thinking about that, and it just bothered me. Every time I, I went over that a hundred times in my mind, and I said, that's not right. Something's wrong with that. And finally, it dawned on me. Our country didn't ask them to do anything. Our country told them to because they work for our country. I asked them to do it. I asked them to do it, and you asked them to do it. We all asked them to do it. I did it for a very selfish reason. I've got two beautiful girls, and I didn't want to worry about them getting blown up, killed, or kidnapped every time they were rolled out of the driveway to go to school or to go to work or go play it with the neighbors. And I have not spent one second of my life ever worried about that because of these guys. So what I'm doing is I'm living with my ask every day. You can see over on the right-hand side of this view is the guy's got two prosthetic legs, uh, the burns, the scars. And a lot of times I have people say, well, they don't look like wounded veterans. I said, come on over here and hang out with them for about five minutes. Um, Dave Grossman once said that, um, God hardwired the animal, all animals not to, uh, kill their own species because the species would fail to exist. He didn't do that with humans. He gave us free will and we kill each other wholesale and it greatly affects everybody that does it. Uh, we don't like to call it PTSD because it's not a disease. We call it PTS. And the best description I have heard yet is PTS is a wound to the soul that needs to be healed. And so that's what we're doing. We're working on that. And we now have over 400 um, Purple Hearts, post 9-11 Purple Hearts in our uh, database. And um, we are working on trying to uh, heal the wounds to the soul. That's great work. Well, they're a great bunch, and when, once you get to know them, you can't walk away from them. And I tell you also, uh, I'm working with CAF right now trying to get more of these guys involved. I think that's a very uh, target-rich environment for us, bringing them in, and uh, it will help them. It will help us. Uh, there's, there's a lot we can get out of that. There's a lot of units that are in military type towns uh, that have a lot of uh, a lot of wounded veterans have settled into those communities so it's all good it's 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 it, like you said there's plenty of organizations out there for veterans but one more if you can just help a few it's uh, it's it's worth it and uh, that's right well, they're all doing something else, uh, something different. Right. Uh, some of them are working on, uh, you know, making houses acceptable, uh, accessible to wheelchairs. And one thing that I've always told the folks at the Warrior Bonfire Program is we can't solve all the problems. But what we do need to do is we need to know who can. And so our the 400 veterans that we've got in our Rolodex are family. And so, you know, we want them to come to us with any kind of 
issues they have. And if we can't deal with it, we'll find out who can and we'll go there. We'll lead them in that direction. So we do a lot of that as well. I know some of the folks who are, who are watching this, uh, they're, they're going to say, how can I, how can I help? Um, and I'm sure there's always financial uh, considerations as well. But I think one of the things you just hit on is that it's maybe that knowledge that might be out there as well that can help uh, maybe direct someone in the right direction, make sure they, they can make the right phone call or right, right connection within the VA. I'm sorry, or within I didn't understand that. The what out there that? Well, there's the people who are watching, uh, they're, they're going to want, I'm sure there's, there's some that are going to want to uh, help. And uh, whether that's a financial donation or just information, uh, you know, advice, whatever, is there a website or, or something that, that folks can go to? Yeah, both organizations uh, have a website, and it's southernheritageair.org and warriorbonfireprogram.org. Okay. And both of them have very good websites that uh, tell a lot about what we do. And um, yes, we would uh, we would love to have any kind of uh, support that we can. It is um, very expensive to keep both programs going, and uh, we can't do it by ourselves. So yeah, any help we can get would be greatly appreciated. SouthernHeritageAir.org and WarriorBonfireProgram.org. Awesome. Well, we are uh, do, creeping up on the top of the hour, but before we get away, we should probably talk about the uh, airplanes that are behind you because, um, you know, Charlotte's Chariot was sort of the inspiration to get all of this this moving forward, but uh, you've got a couple of uh, nice airplanes in there that, uh, and again, as, as we've been talking tonight, it's the airplanes are a vehicle to tell the stories and to, and to help relate to uh to what uh, what World War II was, but uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about those airplanes behind you. Well, we've got uh, everything we've got in here, we got on a rides program. In fact, tomorrow morning, I've got two gentlemen coming in here from England uh, who are taking a ride in a Mustang for the very first time. Um, and so, yeah, there you know, there's somewhat of a debate out there that these things are, are uh, national treasures and they shouldn't be flown. But um, I do agree that there's a place for them hanging from the roof of museums. But I also believe that nothing is like seeing and hearing and smelling uh, the airplanes as they're going, and 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 you know, and and especially being able to take a ride on them. And of course, that's the biggest thing that the CAF is doing as well. Uh, and the CAF is the leader in the industry of that. That's got 170 something airplanes that they are uh, World War II airplanes that they're keeping operational as well. And so this is the pride of the fleet right here. And Kerry Salter was one of the first guys that I interviewed and he flew Charlotte's Chariot 2 during the war. And I told him when I interviewed him that we wanted to, uh, we were gonna do this one day and we wanted to paint it like his. He said, yeah, yeah, sure, right. And then when we were out, uh, we were out in L.A. looking at one to buy, and I called him and I said, Kerry, uh, looks like we're going to be able to make it happen, and we want to name it Charlotte's Chariot, too. What do you think? And he held the phone, and he said, Charlotte, the boy's going to get the Mustang and wants to call it Charlotte's Chariot, too. What do you think? And I heard this raspy voice come from the back of the house. She said, tell him it's going to cost him. <laughs> But I never had any idea what that it what it would do for Kerry. Uh, the last five years of his life, he was a rock star. I took him to Oshkosh one time and put him under the wing of the airplane, and the line never got less than thirty people. Uh, and and I just sat off to the side and, and watched. Like, you flew this airplane? Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. Uh, right after Charlotte died, we brought his two daughters over and gave both of them a ride in the airplane, and it's dad's airplane. We have a picture of mom, circa 1943, uh, on the panel up front, and they just both boo-hooed and jumped out of the airplane and went over and hugged him and said, you are so cool. But he had two and a half kills, and to his dying day, all of his buddies, you had to have five to be an ace, so all of his buddies called him half-ace. Yeah. <laughs> a dying day but it was so wonderful being around these guys and yes these airplanes 
tell the story. And they tell it very well. We have, um, we put on uh, what is becoming one of the largest uh, formation clinics around. We had 42 airplanes this year at the formation clinics, uh, mainly T-6s, but we had about six fighters here as well. And uh, so it's becoming um, one of the biggest formation clinics around. And it's very successful as well. Indeed. And uh, you're also involved in uh, an air show down there as well. Yeah, we, uh, we, uh, our air show, uh, well, we're, we're not doing it here anymore in, in uh, Tallulah. We just, we don't have any people and we don't have any money. We've moved it over to Monroe to a bigger audience uh, and, and more money over there. And so we're able to put on a real air show now. We, we've got jets coming from the Air Force. We've got uh, the Golden Knights. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real air show this time. And we've got a few uh, CAF airplanes going to be there as well. And it is the first weekend of May. I'm not sure of the date. What is that, 4, four 5, and 6, I think, 3, 4, and 5? It's sure. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the first weekend of May. And it's called the Red, White, and Blue Air Show. And uh, so... Yes, we have definitely picked it up a couple of notches, and uh, we've done that the last couple of years. We always put on the greatest little air show in the world, and now uh, we've changed the name of it, but it still is uh, the greatest air show around. It's it's a wonderful show. There we go. You were talking about the uh, the website. There, we've got a screen capture from uh, from the website to uh, wet folks' appetite. And uh, when is the when is the museum open? Uh, we are open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4. All right. And from now until the middle of December. Okay. We just opened back up a couple of weeks ago, so we're open up now to the end of uh, middle to, or end of December. All right. Any uh, final thoughts before we uh, sign off tonight? Well, I thank you for having me here, and I, I really want to thank the CAF as well. The CAF is is definitely the leader in the industry. I'm very involved, have been for a long, long time in the CAF as well. And we do a lot of work in the CAF. The Mississippi wing of the CAF uh, has a couple of airplanes, but we are very fortunate in the Mississippi area that we have, and I don't even know what the latest count is, 10 or 12 or more T-6s right around in the area and three or four fighters. So um, they're not owned by the CAF, but they come to all the CAF functions. And so we, we can put together quite an arma air armada uh, when we have events at the, uh, at the local CAF here. All right. Sounds good. Dan, thank you so much for, uh, for all you do to preserve veteran stories and uh, also everything that you've been uh, doing for the CAF to help uh, keep the organization running as, as, as smooth as it has. Well, thank you for all you do to keep them flying. There we go. And that's going to wrap up tonight's show. Remember to like or share our Warbird Tube videos. We appreciate that. And again, if you are subscribing on YouTube, click the bell icon and we'll send you a notification when our new episodes are posted. All right. If you uh, have any thoughts about tonight's show or any of our shows or something you'd like us to cover in the future, please send Leah Block an email at media at CAFHQ.org. Dan, again, thank you for uh, for being with us tonight. If you are in the area, make sure you stop by and uh, see the Southern Heritage Air Museum and all the, the great uh, displays and great work and all the volunteers who uh, make it possible. I'm Steve Bush. Have a great night and we'll talk to you next week.